Good morning, everyone. Good to see you this morning. According to Charlie Daniels, the devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind because he was way behind and he was willing to make a deal. When he came across this young man, saw him on a fiddle and playing it hot, and the devil jumped up on a hickory stump and said, boy, let me tell you what, I guess you didn't know it, but I'm a fiddle player too. And if you care to take a dare, I'll make a bet with you. Now you play a pretty good fiddle, boy, but give the devil his due. I bet a fiddle of gold against your soul, because I think I'm better than you. The boy said, my name is Johnny, and it might be a sin. But I'll take your bet, you're going to regret, because I'm the best that's ever been. I've got a question from this song, and that is, why did Johnny think it might be a sin to make a wager with the devil? And I think someone might, maybe would say, well, it's gambling. Well, that's right. Maybe someone else said, well, no, you're dealing with the devil. Anything, you know, any dealings with the devil should be sinful. And I think a good argument could be made for that. But let me suggest to you that if for no other reason, it would be a sin to enter in to a wager with the devil when you're putting something as precious as your soul on the line. And I want to kind of develop that point a little bit. I want to think about the value of the soul. It's the only thing you have that will survive eternity. Tell me something more valuable than that. It's made in the image of God. And that distinguishes you from all the rest of the creation. Tell me something more valuable than that. I know it must be of incalculable worth. Because there is a cosmic war that is taking place over it. The devil really is trying to do everything that he can to capture it. And God really is doing everything he can to rescue it. Even to the point of giving his son. For that reason, when you think about the value of the soul, as a matter of fact, Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You have no more precious possession than that. Nor could you ever gain any more precious possession than that. And so for that reason, I would suggest, yes, it is sinful to take something that is sacred and put it in jeopardy for something that is common, and perishable, and fleeting. So I think we need to think about that because people all the time place their soul in jeopardy with little or no thought about what they're risking. And it may be for wealth, it may be for a fiddle of gold, or it may be for acceptance to fit in, or it may be for a pleasure, sexual pleasure, or some type of high that they experience from something, or it may be for fame and popularity. They put at risk the most valuable possession by taking a chance with sin to, at very best, gain something that is very fleeting, perishable, and cheap. Turn over to, math, uh, to Genesis, rather, Genesis 25. I want to look at a passage there because when I think of, of this idea of taking something that is, is sacred and putting it on par, wagering it against something that is so fleeting, I think of Esau. And you may remember the story that I, I'm referring to here. But in Esau, uh, in, in, in Genesis chapter 25, Esau has a brother, Jacob. And uh, it tells us that in verse 29, Jacob was cooking a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. In other words, he was hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name is called Edom, which means red. And Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. All right, so you have these twin brothers. Well, Esau was the older. The birthright goes to him. Now, I want you to think about this birthright just for a moment. 
If you know the family history here, this is quite a wealthy family. God had blessed Esau's grandfather, Abram, with great possessions. He became one of the wealthiest men in all of that area. I don't know what it would be worth today, but it would have to be worth in the millions. We know about how many household servants he had that gives us some indication of his prosperity, and it was incredible. Now, Abram had one heir that all of that inheritance went to. That was Isaac. From what we can tell, Isaac just increased the family worth and value. And Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. But Esau was the oldest, and so the birthright would go to him, which means all of the family fortune would go to him. But let me also tell you that there was more than involved in this than just the monetary value of what the family had accumulated. There were these promises that God had made to this family, to Abram that He would bless them, that He would be with them, and that through them all nations of the earth would be blessed. In other words, really from this point on in Bible, the Bible story, what we're doing is we're following the blessings of this one family. Christ was the end result of that. All of that was included in the birthright that was going to Esau. Esau comes in and he's tired and he's hungry and he says, I want some of that stew. And Jacob makes this preposterous deal. Offers this, I mean, th this is ridiculous. To say, I'll tell you what, I'll give you this bowl of stew, but you give me your birthright. Nobody would make a deal like that. Unless you're really tired and hungry. And then your judgment gets kind of distorted. And you start thinking, well, man, I'm really hungry. That would taste really good. I really want my belly filled. And you lose perspective of what's really valuable. And Esau said, verse 32, Look, I'm about to die. And what profit shall this birthright be to me? I, have you ever said, I'm starving to death? And really what you mean is, I'm hungry, I'm uncomfortable, I'm grumpy because I'm hungry. Not, I'm about to fall over dead. I suspect that was the case here. What good is this prophet? This is birthright to me. And Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. Jacob says, no, I'm serious. I'm not joking about this. I'm serious about this. And Esau swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread, stew of lentils, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. And then look, this is what the... Divine commentary says on this, thus Esau despised his birthright. I don't think it was that, that Esau went around saying, I hate my birthright. I don't think that was the case. He despised it because he didn't value it for what it was really worth. And he was willing to wager it for something that was so temporary, so fleeting. Now, turn over to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The Hebrew writer is going to remind us of that story and warn us with this story. So Hebrews chapter 12 and verse um, 16, he warns us to be careful that we do not become defiled or become profane like Esau in verse 16. Now that you may have the word godless there for profane. But the idea is that it's, it's, it's not focused on the value of spiritual things. It's focused on worthless things. That's, what, that's how Esau was as a person. He was focused on worthless things. Who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Now, here's the application, verse 17. For you know that afterwards, he, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. In other words, when it came time, oh, I really do want the birthright. I really do want a blessing. But he had not valued it before. And the opportunity was lost. The Hebrew writer is saying, you be careful that you don't wager something that is so valuable for something that is so worthless. And that's what people do. 
constantly. So in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, John tells us this, All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. What Satan offers to us is to indulge in the lust of the flesh, to indulge in the lust of the eyes, to indulge in the pride of life. And all he asks in return is to give up eternal life. That's it. What a deal. What John reminds us of is you realize that the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, those things are of the world and the world's not going to last. Those things are going to fade away. They're not here. They're temporal. They don't, they, they don't endure. But following God, committing your soul to God, those abide forever. By the way, we just sang a couple of songs reminding us of the hope that we have of heaven where the soul never dies. That's what we're aiming towards. Let's not forget that because Satan would love for us to forget the value of that. I think there are two reasons why people place the most precious possession they have in jeopardy. And I think one is ignorance. Maybe they just, they, they really don't think about, they're not aware of the danger of what they're placing themselves in and what the consequences might be. They don't really think about, they have never considered the fact that there is a war taking place for our souls that war against our souls, and therefore they're careless and they hang around things, not realizing the great danger that they're subjecting themselves to. And, and that's unfortunate because the Scripture is telling us, screaming at us, that Satan is after us and telling us exactly what his strategies are going to be. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul tells us that we are not ignorant of his devices. We know how He operates. God has revealed how He operates. And we should take that knowledge and we should watch out and we should stay away from those tactics that He uses. And, and, but I think the second thing is I think there are people who are aware of how the devil operates, but they are so confident in themselves that they place their most precious possession, their soul, in jeopardy. Feeling confident, I won't lose it. I, I, that arrogance, I think, is seen in that Charlie Daniels song. It might be a sin, but I'll take that bet. You're going to regret because I'm the best it's ever been. I'm not going to fall to that. I'm not going to be beat by the devil at his own game. And that overconfidence leads to their downfall. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, Paul says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Now, this is right after Paul just talked about the children of Israel and all the blessings that the children of Israel had and how they didn't enter the promised land because they gave in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Right, this is right after Paul said that I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should be cast away. He recognized the danger of that. Don't be overconfident. Beware lest you fall. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Do you remember Peter's confidence when Jesus talks to the apostles and he says, all of you are going to be made to stumble because of me. Peter, hearing this in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 33, answered and said, even if all were made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, this night, even before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said, Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Such confidence there. Such confidence that when the time came, just a few hours later, and Jesus is in the garden praying, praying that this cup would pass away, but if not, let the will of the Father be done. He comes to the disciples, and the disciples are sleeping. And he says, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the, fle the flesh is weak. And what does Peter do with that warning? He goes back to sleep, confident. I can handle it. And when he wakes up, he doesn't handle it real well. He didn't do as great as he thought he was going to do. 
and he ends up fleeing. And three times that very night, I don't know the man. I swear I don't know the man. And he wept bitterly. Peter greatly overestimated his own strength. But later, a much wiser Peter would write to us in 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 8, and warn us to be sober, be alert, be vigilant, be watchful. Remember Jesus said, watch and pray. Now Peter says, be alert and be watchful, for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Peter doesn't have the same arrogance that he had before. Say, like, I would never. Now he says, you better be watchful. You better be alert. Because the devil's no joke. He's savage. And you better be on guard. What's the appropriate response to things, temptations, that place our most precious possession, our soul, in jeopardy. Peter would tell us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. That word abstain has the idea of keep yourself away from it. Get away from it. Anything that puts your soul at risk is to be avoided. Our souls are just too valuable to be put in jeopardy by toying with such things that would potentially cause us to sin. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Romans chapter 13 and verse 14, Paul says this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. No provision for it. Stay away from it. The word flee is used in the Bible to describe an appropriate reaction to putting our soul in jeopardy. You get away from things that are dangerous to your soul. That idea of flee, run, escape. Maybe, maybe you know, uh, you could picture it this way. If I lit a stick of dynamite and threw it in the middle of this building, I think we would probably see what flee means. It doesn't mean walk up to it, pick it up, watch the fuse burn. It doesn't mean stand 10 feet away and see if it's really going to go off or not. It means get out. That's what you would do. You would scatter. Why? Because you don't play with a stick of dynamite that's lit and expect to survive it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. But people put their soul in jeopardy all the time by toying with sexual immorality. Well, it doesn't hurt to look. It doesn't hurt to be close. No, your soul's at stake. Don't make opportunity for it. Don't take your date to some secluded place where you have hours alone together and expect to keep your most precious possession, your soul. Don't flirt with your married co-worker and expect to keep your most precious possession, your soul. Stay as far away from inappropriate conduct as possible. It's your soul that you're talking about here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, flee idolatry. There are Christians that toy with false religion. Paul would talk about that evil companions corrupt good morals. In that particular context, he wasn't talking about fornicators. He wasn't talking about drunkards. He wasn't talking about thieves. He was talking about religious false teachers. And he said, you know that they will corrupt you. Flee. Flee idolatry. Flee false religion. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. Paul tells Timothy, but you, O man of God, flee these things. And the things that he's just been talking about has been the love of money. Greediness, covetousness. Flee these things. This will destroy your soul. Don't see how close you can get to it. Don't toy with it. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. 
I don't know what all. I mean, I've got an, I, I can make a list of things that I think fall under youthful lust. We may think of sexual passions running very strong in our youth, and that's true. But you know what? Pride does too. Ambition for worldly things, that runs strong when we're, we're young. Flee youthful lust. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. One of our memory verses in the drill class. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Here's what Paul says. When you allow bitterness and anger to lodge in your heart, you open the door for Satan. You're playing his game now. When anger pops up, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down. Don't, don't allow that to linger there. Because if you do, it'll cost you your most precious possession. You're giving that foothold to Satan. And I think that people don't think that. Well, I have a right to be angry. If you knew how they did me, how they treated me, I can't just let them get away with that. Be careful. Be careful. So what's interesting is uh, we see Charlie Daniels' song there. And what happens in that song is uh, you know, Johnny takes the bet. They have a showdown playing fiddles. And guess what? Johnny's better than the devil. And the devil's humiliated. The devil realizes he's beat. And he has to hand Johnny the fiddle of gold. And Johnny gets to keep the fiddle of gold and his soul. That's not how it works in real life. Ask Eve. Ask Judas Iscariot. That's not how it works in real life. But I think sometimes we do have that concept that sure, I can, I can beat the devil at his own game. I can play by his rules and still come out okay. And that doesn't work. When Satan asks you to think about how pleasurable sin might be, don't give him a minute of your time. Turn over to Matthew chapter 4. When he begins to negotiate with you, don't try to reason with him. James chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 and 9, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The next thing that Peter says, recognizing that, realizing that he's a ferocious beast, here's what you do. You resist him steadfastly in the faith, verse 9 says. How do you do that? I think Jesus gives us the perfect example. Look in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. So in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. In other words, this is, this is where you kind of have the first major confrontation between God's Son come to earth and the prince who is ruling the earth. And Satan's going to throw his best stuff at Jesus. So here is Jesus in the Spirit. He had fasted 40 days in the wilderness by the Spirit. He had fasted 40 days, 40 nights, and he's hungry. And look at verse 3. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, I think sometimes we think, well, I don't understand what the problem would be with Jesus turning, using his power to turn stones into bread. And I've heard people say before, well, it's because his, his power wasn't to be used for himself. It was to be used for others. And maybe there's something to that. But to me, I think what's going on here is Jesus was led out in the wilderness to fast. That was God's will. Satan is coming and saying, well, look, if you've got the power to do so, and you could prove that you were God's son by doing so, why don't you break your fast and turn this, these stones into bread? Jesus is hungry. I suspect Jesus was much hungrier than Esau was. When Esau said, you know, I'm about to die, I don't think that was very literal. At 40 days with no food, you're getting real close to starving to death. Does Jesus entertain this? Well, you know, really what good would it be if I starved to death out here? That's not how he responded. Look how he responded. He answered and said, it is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. No, I'm committed to following what the Lord says. I won't entertain your wager, your bargain, your deal. I'm not interested. I'm interested in following God. That's where your commitment has to be. If not, you'll end up in trouble. So, the last temptation here of the three that Satan throws at Jesus. Look, if you will, over at, uh, at verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, all these things I give to you if you will fall down and worship me. All right, so here's the whole world. I can offer you the whole world in exchange for your soul. What does Jesus already know about the soul? <laughs> what if you could give me the whole world in exchange for my What kind of exchange would that be? That'd be a terrible exchange. How does Jesus respond? Not, well, let's see what we could do here. How could we work this out? Jesus says, away with you, Satan. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then notice what happens. Verse 11. The devil left him. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How do we resist the devil? We are firm in our commitment. My soul is committed to God. My life is committed to God. My obedience is committed to God. I will not entertain the temptations that Satan throws at me. I will not toy with these things. I have something that God has given me that is so precious and so valuable. I would be a fool to risk that. Away with you, Satan. I will worship the Lord your God. I will serve Him. Him alone. That's the resolve that we have to have. Uh, Timmy mentioned in the prayer that in a few minutes we've gathered here to remember our covenant. When Jesus took the cup, He said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. By the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our souls can be saved. We enter into an agreement, not with the devil, we enter into an agreement with God, that we'll be faithful to Him, and He will save our soul. We remember that as we start off this new week. Along with that, what I want to do in this lesson is to encourage you, as you go through this week, to remember who Satan is, to remember what he's trying to take, and most of all, to remember how precious it is. Don't play the devil's games and expect to win. Be committed to God. Realize what he's offered you and how precious that is. And don't let the fleeting pleasures of this world draw you away and make an exchange that you'll regret for eternity. As we're gathered together, along with words of encouragement, we can offer support to each other in prayer. Is there something we can do to help you in your resolve to be more faithful to God, to resist the devil? Can we pray for you on that? Can, can, is there correction you need to make? Is there, is, is there some way we can help you in obeying what the Lord says to do and being faithful to the Lord? If so, this is a great time to let that be known. We are to admonish one another. We are to encourage one another. We are to support one another. We are to pray for one another. Uh, all of those things, that all of those one another instructions that we have in the New Testament. There's an opportunity to draw that support at this time. So if there's some way we can help you spiritually, we want to offer you the invitation to let that be made known so that we can do whatever we can to assist you in that. Please come while we stand. While we Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.